Hi, this is Medicine with Faisan, and today we are going to talk about left bundle branch block. It is important to understand the concept that the word block doesn't necessarily mean a complete block. Sometimes, of course, there's a refractory period, and if the AV node lets a signal down at a point where the cell has not yet recovered, that part of the conduction system will fail to conduct the signal. It's useful to think of bundle branch block as not so much black or white, but rather that a bundle branch block will appear on an ECG if one side of the conduction system delays the signal with respect to the other side. So if you simply have delay in the left bundle branch system, then the wave of depolarization is able to get to the right side of the heart, and then it's basically a race between the delayed disease conduction branches and the intramyocardial cell to cell conduction. Now both means of conduction are slow, but depending upon which one is slower, that will determine what the QRS complex looks like. So you have a spectrum anywhere from a narrow QRS complex to a very wide, bizarre, typical left bundle branch block, QRS, and a whole bunch of things in between. That's why some people use the term incomplete left bundle branch block to designate an ECG that looks like a left bundle branch block, but it's not wide enough to meet the criteria. So understanding the physiology does help you interpret the ECG, but keep in mind, there's no line in the sand that necessarily establishes normal versus abnormal. It's much more subtle than that. Let's now talk specifically about how we diagnose a complete left bundle branch block. We should recall that the septum of the heart depolarizes primarily from left to right, because it's the branches of the left bundle that depolarize the septum in that direction. So when the left bundle branch does not depolarize properly, you wind up losing evidence of early septal depolarization. Now what is early septal depolarization? Well, in the lateral leads, lead 1, AVL, V5 and V6, a normal QRS complex should have a small Q wave because the initial deflection is away from the lateral leads, from left to right. So you get this negative deflection because it's going away from the lateral leads. Then, of course, the majority of the left ventricle is on the left side, so your vector is mainly down into the left. You get this very tall, positive R wave, and then sometimes a small S wave. Well, in the left bundle branch block, first of all, you lose that early septal activation. Not only that, but it takes so much longer for the signal to go through those intramyocardial pathways that the QRS winds up looking very wide. Generally, to make the diagnosis of complete left bundle branch block, you need a QRS of at least 120 milliseconds. So you lose that septal cue, you have a relatively slowed up stroke, and it's not uncommon to see notching of the QRS complex in the lateral leads. This is very typical of a left bundle branch block with a QRS duration of greater than or equal to 120 milliseconds. So that's in the lateral leads, that's what it looks like. In the precordial leads, keep in mind that V1 is here to the right of the sternum. The heart is lying in the chest with the right ventricle anteriorly. We know that, right? And the left ventricle is posterior. So you have a lot of posterior forces coming late. Septal activation which normally should give you an anterior vector in V1 that will look like a small R wave, and then the rest of the QRS complex is fairly narrow. It very quickly gets around the ventricle and heads back towards the base again, so it doesn't take long for the signal to turn around, and that turnaround point of the signal is known as the intrinsicoid deflection. Think of it as the bottommost part of the QRS complex in V1 and V2. Generally what you see is the intrinsicoid deflection is around 40 or 60 milliseconds after the onset of the QRS complex. In the left bundle branch block, you often lose that septal Q wave, and so what you have is a QS pattern. It's wide, and the intrinsicoid deflection, which is the part where the QRS complex turns around, is often at least 80 milliseconds after the onset of the QRS complex. So what that tells you is that this downward sloping QS wave this part that's going down is slowed. It takes a while to reach its lowest point before it turns around and comes back again. It's just an indication of the wave of depolarization taking a long time to get around the heart. So you have a wide QRS. You have loss of the septal cues and the lateral leads, usually a loss of the R wave in V1, where you have just a QS pattern, although sometimes you can get a little tiny R wave there then delay of the intrinsicoid deflection in the anterior precordial leads. 
So those are the criteria. Now let's look at an example. This is a 12 lead ECG where you can see some notching in lead 1, AVL, and as well as the V6 here. The transition is a bit late here. You can see that you have a QS pattern all the way across the precordium, and it's not until V6 where it becomes this typical positive upright notched pattern. The QRS complex is clearly wide, about 150 milliseconds. There is left axis deviation and absent septal Q waves in the lateral leads, and here there is no R wave in V1 or V2 as well. So you see it's usually pretty easy to make this diagnosis. In the next lecture, we will talk about right bundle branch block pattern, and after that we will have discussion of ECG patterns that are not complete bundle branch blocks, but are actually just incomplete bundle branch blocks, or things which we collectively call interventricular conduction delay. Stay tuned.